201. Uh, if you are just joining us, this is the evidence show. We're going to talk some more about evidence stuff. And if you haven't already joined our Facebook community forum, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, I think most of the names and most of the people that I see on the screen, I've seen before. So hopefully, uh, if you haven't joined that, that Facebook community forum, please do. Uh, it's a great place just to get questions answered for evidence custodians and evidence managers. It is for you. We've got over 500 people on that forum right now, and that's it's becoming a pretty cool place for people to get questions answered. So that's that's been fun. Uh, if you want to check out our website, we're available at evidencemanagement.com. I'm going to run through these things really fast. This is that says episode one. That was just there cleverly to to throw you off the scent. Uh, this is actually not episode one. I don't know why that hasn't been changed. Uh, I'll talk to the staff about that, which is me, but uh, I didn't change that. But this is part two of our discussion on key control. Uh, we we're calling it the keys to the castle. So this is part two. And what we want to help you achieve is true access control over your evidence vault. And one of the ways to accomplish that is through achieving key control and access control. So I'm gonna take probably five minutes, hopefully, and I'll even put myself on the clock to kind of go over what we talked about the last week. But I, first I want to draw your attention to the other two guys on the screen. Oops, I, that's not actually, this is Marty Powers. I, he's at the bottom of my screen. He's waving now. And this is John Murray. They're from a company called Real Time Networks. They're going to show us some pretty cool things that can solve problems for evidence managers. And I'm, I'm excited about this particular show because this is really one of the things that I've wanted to do with this webinar or with this podcast series is, is show people things that are available out there that can make a difference and can solve problems for you in your evidence room. Uh, hopefully this will be one of those days. I'm gonna really quick run through some of what we talked about. Last week we talked about, or not last week, the last episode or broadcast, we talked about key control and access audits. Uh, we talked about the importance of knowing who has keys to your evidence vault and knowing how many keys exist out there. I'm not gonna go over each of these in detail, we talked about after hours access. And that's one of the things that I will talk with Marty and John about. This is kind of, for me, this is this is a, an issue that has just bothered me for ages. And there are some really good solutions out there. Just very few people are doing them. Uh, we talk about who belongs in the vault, which for us in the evidence world, I believe that that means evidence unit personnel and people who are escorted by evidence unit personnel. Nobody else really has or can make a compelling business case in most cases to have access to your evidence vault. Um, we talked about high security door hardware. The fact that if it comes from Home Depot, it's not high security. If anyone can make a copy of your keys, then it's not high security. So we discussed all this. If you haven't watched it, go back and watch it. It's incredibly compelling. It's exciting television. It's something that you'll not want to miss. Uh, but we also talked about issues like when do we rekey? And most evidence training platforms that exist talk about rekeying evidence facilities at certain intervals. When there are security breaches, when there are lost keys, when there's a change in evidence staff, when there's a change in executive leadership or command level leadership, most training platforms, most training classes recommend rekeying evidence vaults. Uh, that can be a very expensive process. It can be a very complicated process, uh, but those are the recommendations. They're pretty much universal. There is one exception. And the cool thing is today we're going to talk about that exception or one way to accomplish that exception, but I don't want to bury the lead. Uh, I want to continue to plow through this. We talked about standards and best practices. I'll refer you back to our website, evidencemanagement.com, if you want to read more. We speak specifically about security and safety standards that deal specifically with locks, locking systems, keyless access systems. We talk about card control or card access audits. We talk about key audits. All those important processes uh, you can learn about more on our website, in our standards. And we talk about just 
security as a bunch of links in a chain. And, and key control is a huge link in the fundamental security of your evidence facility. Without tight control over keys and access cards, then you really don't have a secure environment for your keys. I'm gonna skip number nine, just in the interest of time. And this is where we get to what we're talking about today. Uh, number 10 from last time, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I believe there is a better way to do this. And that's why these two guys that have just had to sit there kind of staring at the screen awkwardly for the last five minutes, that's what they're here to talk about. So I would like to introduce uh, Marty Powers and John Murray from Real Time Network. So if you want to introduce yourselves, gentlemen, now would be a good time. Sure. Yeah, I'm, again, Marty Powers, Director of Business Development uh, for Real Time Network. And uh, again, we're here to talk about Key Tracer as a product. Uh, John, sitting there right behind one of our evidence lockers. Uh, John, maybe you want to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm John Murray. I'm the sales uh, engineer here at Real Time Networks. Uh, we're going to show you the key system uh, that's kind of off to my right here. Uh, and then I'm sitting in front of one of our uh, asset tracer series of uh, of lockers um, that can provide a uh, uh, evidence management solution that's uh, a little more automated than keys. Awesome. So one of the things we talked about last week is how do you achieve, I keep referring to last week. It's just a common reference. Let's pretend it was last week. Uh, we don't really exist in space or time here, but we talked about the fact that technology exists that can control and document access to keys and card readers for your agency. Technology exists that can prevent the need to rekey your evidence facility, uh, even if there is a change. I mean, there's, there's a way to achieve security and key control security without rekeying the facility. And if you've ever rekeyed a facility that uses extremely high security locks, that, that's an expensive proposition. Doing that more than once uh, can become very costly. There is a, a system, there is a technology, there technology exists that can provide remote access if there is absolutely a compelling reason or a need to get into the evidence facility. And something that can provide 100% accountability over access control. And that's why I brought Marty and John here to talk about their key control system and the way that it works. So what we would like to, what I would like to, discuss is, I mean, I've got four things and I haven't surprised them, but what what would really help the people that are watching this broadcast, the thing that would be important for them to see is what you do, kind of explain what you do, and then how does that help us keep track of all the keys that we have for our evidence vaults? Um, and, and I'll start with a small, this is, and this was off script, this is just going to be fun because we're going to improvise. But uh, I was thinking this morning as I was looking for my own personal keys uh, and I couldn't find them. They were in several different pants that uh, I couldn't necessarily put my hands on early in the morning. But one of my pet peeves at our, at our police department when I was running an evidence unit was we had a van that we took to the lab and we had one employee who would lose the keys to the van. And it bothered me to the point to where we eventually purchased a system similar to this because, I mean, I wanted to know who had the keys. It's important to know who has the keys to the evidence van so we can go to the lab. Uh, knowing who has those keys, if you don't have a system in place, then nobody owns up to losing the keys when they lose them. So how would your system help me as a, as a manager keep track of just, just the keys to the evidence van? How, how, how could we keep control over that? Yeah, yeah, sure. I can answer that. Um, I can, for all those people out there that aren't really familiar with key systems, there's a couple different out there or terminology I want to introduce you to. One is uh, individual locking versus non-individual locking keys. That's the first thing you start off with. When it comes to um, evidence key management or even the van example, uh, you want the ability to get into that cabinet, usually with, with a pin access or access card is how you get in to authenticate. Uh, you can escalate that to a facial or iris scanning or finger fingerprint scanning as well. So once it knows it's you and you are able to, uh, the screen will light up and you're allowed to pick the keys that relate to your what you need. It could be several keys or one key. 
uh, but only the keys that you are allowed to have. Uh, so once the box opens, um, you would, it would light up and it would tell you which key you can take. It could be one or, or several keys. Uh, it's important to note too, when you're looking at key systems too, um, most key systems out there are contact based. Um, so that way when you put it inside there, they wear it over time. The uniqueness with our system is we have an RFID chip inside each key fob. Similar to your MasterCard or credit card that when you tap to pay, we have one of those inside there. Um, so back to the van example, if you need that key to get it, um, you'll pin in, access card, take that key, you'll use it in the van. They'll know it was you, it's tracked because of your pin number or access card. It's a full reporting system, which you can access at any time. It can even email you on event as well. And then when you are done using that van and you come back, it would be again, access card or pin to authenticate who you are. And then you tap the key, that's all you have to do. So there's an RFID chip in there. It will pop open and it will put it back inside the system. Uh, so anytime you're taking a key, you have a full audit report of when, who, and where um, the keys are going. So. Absolutely. So why don't you show off your system and just show us how it works and, and how, just, just give us the, give us the, the tour. Yeah, for sure. Um, so our system is going to be a little bit more unique because um, the design process for us, uh, we include figuring out what keys you're going to be storing. This meaning, what are the types of keys? Are they vehicle keys? Are they keys to an evidence room? Are they keys to maybe cells? Um, or are they building keys? So we, we define what types of keys they are. Um, then we define how big they are. What are these key sets going to look like? That's going to uh, help us define what panel types we need to, to incorporate in the system. Once we figure, figure out the, the panel types that we need, uh, and the amount of keys, we can then um, go into, do we want expandability in our system? Um, the short answer is always gonna be yes. We, we always want expandability, um, but it's always gonna come down to, of course, the budget. Um, and that's where we can, we can uh, play around with different systems and try different combinations because it's so modular. Uh, the other thing that we look at is how do you want your users to access the system? Is this going to be um, through a PIN code? Is this through an access card? Do you want to use biometrics uh, as, as an option? Uh, as technology gets more and more uh, expansive and, and um, uh, things move forward, you got to look for the future. Um, typically with the police that we uh, speak with and work with, uh, on a daily basis, we're looking at um, card access is going to be sort of your bare minimum. Uh, and this typically includes uh, your existing access control system for your facility. Uh, additionally to that, uh, a lot of our uh, clientele are looking at biometric readers like we see on the right hand side of our, our system here. So they're looking to uh, integrate that new advanced technology to to assist with them accessing those keys. And now, okay, can I can I jump in and just I will tell you from from my perspective as a as an evidence management trainer the what I would want to see in a system like this is I would want the biometrics and I'd want a a picture taken when you access your keys. Uh, one, because anybody could take anybody else's key card and access the system. And I get that that for most environments, that works perfectly. There's real time. I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but so you can use biometrics and get a photo of every person that's ever taken a key out of your system. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, to, yeah, to, the, yeah, and to the right of the system right there, uh, if you see that one terminal, to the right of it, we have the ability of the camera right above that. It looks like a... Um, Kind of a tablet. Uh, in addition to doing um, facial recognition on that device, it's non-touch palm. It also takes your temperature and determines if you're wearing a mask as well. And if you're not beyond that temperature, you're not wearing a mask. It will send an email alert. We attach them to the system. They also can be attached to a door exit system as well, preventing access from people coming in that exceed those threshold temperature and mask. Uh, we even have a questionnaire on it too. Uh, the ones you're seeing lately with COVID-19. To, to get bed, so they're bedded before they access the facility or the key system. And once they're inside with the key system, obviously they've 
you know, that's just a secondary one that you'd want to have to the exterior of that building. So, so yeah, to answer your question in a roundabout way, yeah, it does take your picture as well. Okay. And that's, and we would make that baseline recommendation. If, if you're looking at a key control system, you want something that's going to individualize the access to a single person. Now, is it possible that you could take the thumb of another person with you and, and access it if it was fingerprint? Possibly you might take their eye if you need an iris scan, but we're not, we're not thinking that either of those circumstances are going to be common. We're going to just make this, this, the default assumption that, that iris scans and biometric, you know, thumbprint scans are both safe scans. And I think do y'all have like facial recognition as well. Yeah. And one thing I want to point in the facial recognition too, the one that we have right there, it does depth of perception as well. Um, you got to be cautious of facial recognition because some of the, less sophisticated ones or, or maybe the ones that are a little bit cheaper, you can hold a picture up. And when they hold a picture up, then it'll open. So you want to make sure that if you're looking at facial for any authentication, whether it be a key system or even a door system, make sure it has the depth perception and ours does. Okay. So with your system, like one of the big headaches is just keeping track of all the keys that we've got. So I'm assuming that by, if, if you have the practice and the process and the policy set up to where every key to your facility, to your evidence facility is going to be placed in, the, in a key tracer or a key control system. So that solves keeping track of all the keys that are in existence. Now, if we make the assumption that all of these keys are high security keys that cannot be duplicated, once they're placed in that security environment, the thought process is you can you can guarantee that that key has not been or cannot be duplicated. You've got the the you know the existence and the the chain of custody for that key for the entire duration of its its custody, very similar to evidence. So once it's in the system, uh, how do we know? I guess how would we know who has accessed which keys and when? Yeah, sure, John. You want to answer? Do you want to answer that? Yeah, so with our system, uh, when a user accesses the keys, um, we're creating a uh, essentially a report or ledger of each transaction. Um, and these are, these are dynamically set in real time. So as users are using the system and inputting uh, information of the keys that they're taking, uh, it's automatically uploading that um, to, uh, to a server. Um, and the server's typically on, on prem uh, just for that added security. Um, and it allows administrators uh, through a web browser on their network to actually sign into a management software, view all the transactions. They can get these transactions emailed as well on a daily or, or weekly or even monthly report if they'd really like to. Um, and then it gives them granularity uh, through um, custom reports of, of looking at specific keys, uh, when they were taken, who took them, uh, and we can even have users present the reasons why they're taking specific sets of keys as well. Okay. Now let's say, let's go worst case. Uh, I'm an evidence manager. I work in an evidence vault and I have to fire someone for doing something, whatever. Uh, how easy is it to control access on the fly and to remove access for employees that are in the system? I might jump in for a second. Um, that's a good question. Uh, obviously, you can do it manually by putting the information in. And if someone leaves the organization, you'd have to delete it manually. But we also have an LDAP integration, which a lot of the larger organizations want to use. So it pushes and pulls information dynamically. So again, if you have a large organization, again, if you're small, you'll know to delete that person. You don't need that service. Uh, but that would probably be the best method in terms of having it. So once they're taken out of your, your server, they're also taken out of our system as well. Uh, John, do you have any comments to add? Yeah, that, that's exactly how I, how I would approach that. Um, a, any sort of dynamic integration, whether it's Active Directory or uh, through your access control software, um, it, it, it's really going to aid with that, uh, with that management of users. Okay. Well, and as we continue, I've got a couple more questions for you, but if you have questions, if you're watching out there in the internet world and you have questions about what we're talking about or questions about this, please ask them and put them in that question window. Uh, if not, I'll give you an email address where you can contact 
Marty and ask questions directly, or you can contact me. I do want to kind of add that I don't sell this stuff. This is not for me. It's not a, a sales pitch. I don't get paid for having these guys on. I just think that there's value in this technology and there's value in, in showing you technologies like this because it solved problems for me. Uh, we used a very similar key control system. It was a little, it was a long time ago, uh, but it was, it was similar. And it solved a ton of problems for me as an evidence manager. And that's why I'm having Marty and John on to talk about this technology. Because another one of the issues that comes up, and this is one of my uh, soapbox issues, or it just makes me mad, you'll start to see sweat develop. And when I think about it is after hours access. Now, I'm going to go on record and say, I don't think that there are very many compelling business reasons or user reasons to allow anyone to access our vaults after hours. But let's say that someone comes up with the perfect storm scenario where we have to get access into our vaults. And I'm not talking there's somebody sick or injured because the evidence eradication team is going to come in with their stuff and they're going to break things and they're going to, they're going to come in. Fire guys can get into our vaults. We're not worried about that. We're talking about a time when we need to get into the vault after hours and we don't want to leave a key on the captain's desk and the desk drawer. I mean, I've literally done, you know, audit work for agencies and that's where you find the keys to the evidence vault. It's in the captain's desk, literally his desk or her uh, right there in the corner. Sometimes they're even so clever as to put it on a hook underneath their desk, which is, still their desk or they'll have a key hanging in the jail that's supposed to be checked out in order to access those areas and it's not just uh it's not just after hours access this could be access to an outdoor security vault if you've got bulk temporary bulk storage it could be keys to temporary bulk storage any of these might be compelling reasons after hours where you would have to give somebody access how does your system, Marty and John, how would your system, let's say it's 3.30 in the morning, uh, I'm not coming in to allow anybody anywhere. Uh, is it possible to give people access to keys if they didn't have that access before, if they can wake me up or wake a, 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 an administrator of the system up at that time? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you have access to the system, uh, you can restrict it to a certain amount of time or you can extend it uh, across a larger amount of time. And so when they go up again, they would authenticate, you know who it is, they would only get their key. Uh, in addition to that, if for some reason someone had to get a key and it was an emergency um, and you're off site, but you can actually VPN in or you have access to the software, you have a, a representation of this box on the software, you'll see it. If you have multiple boxes, you'll have a representation of each. And what you do is you hover over the key. It tells you what it is. You click on it, hit yes, and the door will pop open and release that key as well. So in case of emergency, you have that. But typically, it's again tapping the system with your card or facial scanning, and you take the key out. And it doesn't matter what hour it is. You just have to uh, allow for that uh, that time frame for that person to have access to the key. John, did you want to make any comments on that? Yeah. In in addition to that, you you can also assign keys individually users as well so if they didn't already have access to that particular key maybe they're on their way over uh, you don't want to release it right away for them uh, but they're calling you in advance you can give them that assignment you can do a one-time assignment or you can just do it uh, from from there on um, and you can give them access to that key so when they get there they just need to present their card and, and pull it out of the system okay well, that would definitely be a much better solution for after hours access or granting someone after hours access than leaving a key in the captain's desk or leaving a key in the jail or one up in dispatch. Uh, that's just, you might as well not use keys or, or locks if if that is the security protocol that, that you're operating under. Um, so for a key control, uh, here's another, and we might've talked about this, Marty, but I kind of have this belief. I didn't make my employees do it. I didn't personally hold myself to this standard. So this is a bit hypocritical. But the longer I teach about this, the more security minded I become. And I always took my keys home with me uh, at the end of my shift and take my key card reader home at the end of my shift. But 
if you really want to provide a true and robust security environment, there is a consideration for leaving, you know, taking your door key home with you, maybe leaving that as the only key on your keychain. But your card reader, instead of having a card reader that accesses everything, have maybe one card reader that gets you into the building and one card that's specific to the evidence vault. Do y'all have a way of storing cards or providing access? Like if I wanted to just have all of my evidence vault doors on a separate key card reader or card reader system, do y'all have anything that would that could store those cards for me? Yeah, yeah, sure. We have another um, uh, assistant link beside that one. Uh, John, maybe you could show. We have an assist a panel that can store cards as well. Um, but also, I'll add as well that if you have keys, uh, in addition to cards that you don't want to leave in the building, especially keys, um, as I mentioned, we have RFID chips in the fobs, and they're passive. Just again, credit card example is the best example. But in addition to that, we have active RFID too. You can attach that to the keys if they ever leave the system as a door trap, and it can give an audible, visual, and email alert when it leaves. A lot of jails use this system because they don't want it leaving the facility. Now, that's keys. You know, your card example. If you look at the panel right there that John's accessing, uh, we have little slots in there where you can put the access control cards as well. So that way when you're taking them or returning them, you'll have an audit report of that. And that card can be pre-programmed and get you into certain parts of the facility that you're allowed to get into. So does that okay. answer the question? Yeah, because I, I love the idea of being able to control granularly access to the evidence vault. And I mean, not even leaving the opportunity uh, to exist for having, I mean, if I lose my card reader, you know, if I lose my keys, that's a significant liability exposure. Uh, and if I lose my keys and I lose that, that set, even if it's on a key control system like this, I still have created a problem. So I think there's a pretty compelling, you know, business reason for thinking about just leaving all those keys at the police department in the vault, in a system like this, to where you don't, have the, the possible uh, eventuality or, or, or potential for just losing those keys outright. So uh, one thing I wanted to add, and I try to keep these to about 30 minutes. So uh, and I'll, I'll check for questions here in just a second, but I wanted to talk and, and we'll talk a, in, a, in a future episode or broadcast. Uh, one of the things that real time does that I think is also pretty cool, we're not going to have time to talk about it right now, but we'll we'll, we'll bring these guys back uh, a little further down the road to talk about evidence lockers, because the same technology that exists to control access to keys and card readers, you can do for evidence vaults, uh, for temporary lockers. You can provide temporary access to officers uh, using the same type of technology. It's pretty cool. I'll have them show us that at a later date. But uh, this is kind of what I wanted to show you today. I wanted to show you this technology, the fact that it exists, the fact that it's affordable. And you mentioned something about the, the CARES Act. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of the key uh, cabinets have been uh, some of the customers actually have the access to CARES Act funding. Uh, in addition to that, um, we have a UV kit, uh, which you can put inside the system as well, which could help you know, towards sanitizing the keys as well. Uh, I know one jail recently uh, using UV light allowed them to use the CARES Act. We've had other customers, depending where they are, having a lot of success. And again, it doesn't pay for all of it, but it subsidizes the key cabinet. So that's something that's relevant today um, as well. Yeah, because for in our world, getting people to pay for things is is difficult uh, sometimes, despite our best efforts. Yeah. So if there is grant funding out there for something like this or, or you know, federal subsidies that could potentially pay for some of this, I think, why not? Let's take advantage of it while we have the opportunity. I'm gonna look for questions. Uh, and again, if you don't have any now, reach out to me. I'll also give you uh, Marty's contact information if you wanna, if you've got a question for him that, that uh, that you have specific to key control, but hopefully this has been the kind of thing that, you know, if you if you knew that this existed, if you were aware of it, maybe we could help kind of build a case for for implementing a system like this inside your evidence vault. If it's something you weren't aware of, good, we've accomplished our objective. 
but uh, I just want to thank Marty and John for being here and showing off their toys. Yeah. And uh, let me give you Marty's contact information. And I'll leave this up on the screen, but I've got to get to my screen first. So there's Marty's information. Hopefully it's okay that this goes out. And if not, I can put my hand over it or something. But uh, there's his information. If you if you need his information, contact me directly. Just reach out either through our website or Sean at evidencemanagement.com or S. Henderson at evidencemanagement.com. I'll be happy to forward that information on. But this is the kind of stuff we want to start leveraging available technology, technology that has been in place in different industries for years. I mean, this type of key control technology, I think it started in the automotive industry. Is that accurate? Well, I, knew, I know key control is really important automotive, actually. That's a good question. I mean, I think so. But I know it's been around for quite some time. Uh, this system since, I think, uh, I think 1990s. I think yeah. key control system. I know our company started in... John wasn't around in 1995, I think, is when a lot of this came about, if not sooner. I think after 9-11, that's when it became more to the forefront. Security became a lot more increased. I hear that's when things really started rolling with key control uh, for security reasons. I'm not sure if John wants to add to that. Yeah, no, that, that's, uh, that's right on the nail on the head. Yeah, 1995 was a long time ago. You know, 2001, 9-11, those were both dates pretty far back. So law enforcement has always been a very late adopter of technology. Uh, these are proven technologies. They've existed for a long time. I think, I think it, I think there are some really compelling reasons for looking at this for your evidence vault to secure your keys, to, to, to make it possible for you to know how many keys you have out there, who has access to them, to control that access, to run audits over that access, to provide after hours access. There are just so many different little wrinkles with respect to key control that a system like this will solve. Uh, I think there's a there's a really compelling reason to, to look into this if you haven't already. Um, if you have questions, email me, email Marty at the email address below. Uh, we'll be back next time. I think our next episode is October 15th. Uh, I don't have a topic just yet but uh, I will get back with you very soon. So thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, John, for being online and joining us. Time. But uh, again, till next time, uh, reach out. Thank you for being here. All right. Thanks.